As Democrats debate in Detroit, the president is keeping up his attacks on Baltimore. Mr. Trump has spent the past few days criticizing the city and Maryland Democratic Congressman Elijah Cummings. The president claimed Baltimore is a, quote, disgusting, rat and rodent infested mess. Congressman Cummings has represented the majority African American district for over two decades. He's also the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, which has launched numerous investigations into the White House. The president's clash with Cummings comes after a Another feud with four congresswomen of color. Mr. Trump posted racist tweets telling the so-called squad to go back where they came from. The Washington Post reports the president's advisors feel the overall message sent by such attacks on Cummings are good for the president's base, adding, quote, this has prompted them to find ways to fuse Trump's nativist rhetoric with a love it or leave it appeal to patriotism ahead of the 2020 election, while seeking to avoid the overtly racist language the president used in his tweets about the four congresswomen. Yesterday, the president denied there was any strategy involved. There's zero strategy. All it is is I'm pointing out facts. The most unsafe city in the country, in our country, is Baltimore. It's received as much money, it's, it receives top of the line, billions of dollars. Somebody said $15 billion over a short period of time. So there's no strategy, it's very simple. And Elijah Cummings is in charge of it. And he ought to take his oversight committee and he ought to park him in Baltimore and find out what happened to the $15 billion and a lot of other money. Liz Harrington is the national spokeswoman for the Republican National Committee and joins me now. Liz, thank you so much for coming to see us. Thanks for having me. I just want to read one more line from this Washington Post story that we quoted at the top. Um, it says, the president's allies say that combative approach appeals to white Republicans who are tired of being accused of racism. So. Does the RNC see the president's derogatory comments as helpful in terms of an election strategy? It has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with ideas and ideology and what the president is saying uh, and actually what Elijah Cummings has said, that his own district in 1999, he said, was drug infested. And yet decades have gone by. And what has he done for the people of Baltimore? The president is saying the Oversight Committee would be much better served for taxpayers if they looked into corruption in their own districts instead of phony witch hunts into this Russia conspiracy theory that's been long since put to death. So the RNC doesn't see any problem with some of this language in terms of perhaps alienating voters of color? No, not at all. It's not about race. It's at everything to do with ideas. And the fact of the matter is Democrats have run cities like Baltimore, Detroit, San Francisco for decades. And what results have they done for their constituents? The president, an outsider, has come into office for two and a half years, historically low unemployment for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans. He got criminal justice reform passed. It's not about rhetoric, it's about results. And Donald Trump is delivering for minority communities. At the same time, though, there are people who say his words are hurtful, regardless of whether they intended to be that way. Uh, so can you see why those words would be hurtful to some people? And what would you say to those people? I would say look at the results. And I would also say point to the rhetoric of Representative Cummings, who said very derogatory things about our border patrol and the conditions at the border. And I think it's a troubling trend of Democrats demonizing our border agents, the same with the Socialist Squad, comparing our border patrol to running concentration camps along the border. That's divisive rhetoric. That's un-American rhetoric that we do not like. And it has everything to do with these ideologies. They're pus pushing very dangerous far left socialist policies with the squad. Well, and so we want to constantly point that out because we want to keep on the track of this revitalized American dream or do we want to go down the road to socialism with this squad in the House? Well, they are elected, democratically elected representatives, so whatever they are debating is something that is done in a very American way. I mean, to say that they're un-American is, is incorrect. I would say look at their language, look at their rhetoric. And dismissing 9-11 as some people did something is what Ilhan Omar said. She's on camera laughing about al-Qaeda. I would what love if the media would ask her, why, why did you react that way in that interview? I think these are very troubling statements. They have a history of very anti-Semitic statements. 
and it's dangerous and I do not they're normalizing this in the Democratic Party and I think it's a real problem for them so you don't see a problem for the Republican Party going forward after Donald Trump I mean he may be reelected he may not be reelected but even so he will not be at the head of the party forever so you don't think that this language is alienating a whole slew of voters who could come into the Republican fold no, not at all. It, did Bernie Sanders alienate people when he said Baltimore is like a third world country? Where was the media? Where are the Democrats on that? It was Cummings alienating people when he called his own district drug infested and yet has done nothing for the people of his district. I think that's what it is about. He's pointing out the facts. The former mayor of Baltimore, who had to leave for corruption, is on camera as well, saying there's rats right in front of us and it smells here. I mean, well, these are troubling images. Let me just read these to you are, some poll numbers. A recent poll by Quinnipiac uh, University found that 6% of African Americans approve of the president's job. Well, 84% disapprove. Meanwhile, polls from 2016 show President Trump received only 8% of the black vote. Does that, does that not even worry the RNC just from a numbers perspective? I think those numbers are going to grow. Look at the accomplishments for the African American community under this president. The First Step Act has been a huge win. It was bipartisan. It was something that no other president was able to get through, and President Trump delivered. And again, look at the, the wage growth. Look at the unemployment. All-time low for black Americans hit under this presidency. That's going to continue to stay low. It's going to continue to drive down because it's a pro-growth agenda of low taxes, low regulation. That's going to work for all Americans, including African Americans. And meanwhile, the Fed just cut interest rates for the first time since the 2008 recession. How is the RNC capitalizing on that? We think it's great news. The president has been calling for this. It might not have been as big as uh, he wanted, but we think it's good news. The economy is booming by all measures. Uh, we saw great numbers come out today about wage increase, $150 billion in the first six months of this year, more than the final year of the Obama-Biden presidency. That is an astounding number. That's only going to go up because this economy is really starting to work for all Americans. All right, now we are having this conversation as the Democrats prepare for night two of their debates. Who is the candidate the RNC is most worried about? I would say they're pretty much one in the same at this point. Last night we saw 10 candidates debating not uh, how socialism is bad, just should we go full throttle or half speed? Because they were arguing against not whether to eliminate private insurance, but how quickly can we get there? Because make no mistake, uh, the so-called moderates on that stage support a public option, which was designed to eliminate private insurance, which over 200 million Americans have, and they do not want to lose and get kicked off into a one-size-fits-all government-run plan. I do want to ask you that we are seeing a wave of Republican retirements in Congress that are coming a little earlier than they usually do, sort of before traditional recesses. Why is that, do you think? And does this worry you, specifically since another Republican woman has just retired and re the Republican Party doesn't have a whole lot of female Congresswomen right now? I think one of the factors on that is uh, the House uh, Republicans, when we took over the House in the 90s, instituted term limits for leadership. And so there's kind of a ceiling there if you don't move into leadership that you move on. So I think that's one factor. But I think we're going to have a very good chance about taking the House back because the Democrats have really gone down a, a, a path that's very radical and too radical for these moderate swing districts that they won on in 2018. So I think we're very optimistic. We see Democrats haven't delivered in the House. And meanwhile, the president and the Trump administration continues to deliver. Would you like to, would you like to see more female Republicans in Congress? Always. We we love I mean we've great we've got great Republican female supporters uh, our donations are now uh, up 50 it's 50-50 50 /50 women uh, donating to our campaign. We have great enthusiasm. We're always looking for new Republican Why does it seem candidates. it's been tough though right now to sort of keep the women there? I don't or get I don't, them all the way up, get them all the way through. A lot of them enter the races but don't quite I think it's always more difficult to get passionate, good, conservative candidates because they're usually making their own way in private sector and we're not, conservatives by and large aren't super uh, interested in going into government because we like the private sector so much more. So it's always a challenge getting passionate, good Republican uh, candidates to run for office. Liz Harrington, thank you so much for coming to see us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.